Hello, Cyber World, and very welcome to this online conference on the CAGE study. Um, we are more than 350 participants to this uh, from, from all the Nordic countries, of course, but also from faraway places like Japan, Ethiopia and Belarus here together today. Thanks to this amazing technique, we can actually gather together in cyberspace and get together focusing on young refugees and how they are doing in the Nordic countries. So I'm very happy to be here today. Although a bit lonely, I must admit. But I don't think we are going to have a dull moment together. We have a very ambitious schedule. We have invited 17 researchers and experts, and they will all give us a brief resume of their findings, together with comments and aspects on the different issues of this study. So the first part of this conference is mainly presentations and comments, and at the end, around quarter to three, we open up for discussions and comments. So please let us know from you um, by using this email address, ask at nordradio.org. I'm not actually all alone here tonight, today. Uh, by my side and in a, on a corona safe distance, I welcome you the host of today from the Nordic Welfare Center, Kristin Marklund. Hello, Kristin. Thank you, Paula. <coughs> so, Kristin, what is going to happen here today? What can we expect from Yes, today? I'm going to tell you briefly. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here for the opening of this Nordic conference today. And uh, today we're going to cover young refugees in the Nordic countries regarding to their health, education and their inclusion in the labor market and how this relates to national policies in the Nordics. I work on the, on the Nordic Cooperation and Integration project launched by the Nordic Council of Ministers. The focus of the project is to facilitate um, a cooperation between the Nordic countries on the integration of refugees. It has been a pleasure arranging this conference in collaboration with the CAGE project, Coming, <coughs> coming of, a of Age in Exile to share the findings of the tremendous research that has been produced over the last five years. The CAGE project is financed by Nordforsk, and all the research presented here will be summarized in a report that is published today, and you can find it on our website, integrationnorden.org. There you will find a wide range of information, for example, compiled research on on labor market integration my, and uh, unaccompanied minors, health and well-being, and much more. It is important to disseminate and implement research into practice, and I hope that the knowledge presented here today will contrib contribute to improving support for young refugees in the Nordics. Finally, I would like to thank Alan Kresnik Signe Smith Järvelund from the University of Copenhagen and my colleague Helena Lagerkrans at Nordregio and all the researchers at the CAGE project for making this event possible. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And now our first guest on the conference is Mr. Eric Nilsson of Stockholm. Very welcome, Eric. Are you with us? Hello. Listen, and Eric, uh, uh, I would like, like to start, start by asking you a personal, personal question. question. Um, um, besides, besides doing, doing this kind of uh, conferences, conferences, I'm actually, I'm actually working, working as, as a teacher, teacher teaching Swedish as a second language. language. So, uh, so uh, my question to you is, how, how can I inspire my young students to take their Swedish, Swedish studies seriously? seriously? Uh, why is it so, so important for them to learn Swedish more than enough? Well, first of all, uh, we can see when we look into the labor market and the possibilities to establish uh, in society, on the labor market and in society, that in a country like Sweden, uh, it's very, education is very important. And we see that uh, in Sweden, the, the, the level is actually an upper secondary level. So you need to, to reach that in order to have a good chance on the labor market. So that, that would be the, 
blunt answer to that question, not to talk about all the all the possibilities to take part in society, to, to be active also as, as, as a member in a democratic society. That is also, of course, essential to, to understand and, and to, to be able to use your Swedish. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so, so um, and now, now you are going to, to uh, take, us take us further on, on uh, when it comes to education and why, it, why it's important for, for young refugees in, in all the Nordic countries, of course. Mm -hmm. So please, please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you very much for the organizers of this uh, conference. I think it is a very relevant issue, I think, for all uh, the Nordic countries uh, to discuss how do we create paths for young refugees to succeed in the educational system and be able to establish themselves in society and into the working life. Uh, in 2015, all the Nordic countries received many, many young refugees. Um, uh, not only in 2015, actually, but in, in also in years ahead of that, and we still re receive young refugees, but not in the in the kind of figures that we had in 2015. Only in Sweden, uh, we received about 75,000 young people under the age of 20 during one year, uh, which was, of course, an exceptional strain uh, to the Swedish education system. And we are still working and struggling with how do we how do we deliver good educational possibilities for these uh, young refugees? Uh, I would like just to say three um, lines or three points uh, where the Swedish government ha have tried to do actions and, and to improve the education system for, uh, for these young refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, first of all, uh, to improve the progression of uh, the, the, the refugees, the young refugees in the system. We could see quite easily that um, there, was, there is no big problem if you arrive in Sweden when you're very young. If for, for the refugees that come before we, have the, uh, we start the, the compulsory school in Sweden, we see practically no difference between, in the results in the school between uh, foreign-born uh, students and, and students born in Sweden. If you, if, you, if you compare with the same class background, if I put it like that. Uh, but we have big difficulties for the ones that arrive late in the compulsory school in grades 7, 8 or 9, or that arrives during uh, the upper secondary level, uh, which is not compulsory, <laughs> but in reality is almost compulsory. So we can see that arrival time in Sweden and class background is very decisive for how it goes in the system. So we need to improve, improve progression. And what kind of means do we use for that? Well, one is a very good analysis of the students' knowledge when they come to Sweden so that we can provide uh, adapted uh, teaching for them, not only to, to, to analyze their, their abilities in Swedish, because their abilities in Swedish is, not, is very low <laughs> initially, but to actually analyze what do they know in science, in maths, and in social science, and so on to see what can we build on uh, from uh, the, the kind of educational background that they have from their own countries, from their original countries. Uh, it is also, of course, important to have a quality education in Swedish as a second language. We need to have more teachers qualified in Swedish as second language. We have a lack of that in Sweden, and we're working hard to have more teachers uh, to know the specific skills that you need to, to teach students who haven't got Swedish as their first language. Those skills are, by the way, good also for <laughs> Swedish students uh, that have a, a not a very strong language. So it, it's a good investment to work with teacher uh, professional development there. Um, but we also need to organize the, the reception and the education for these refugee students in a good way. Uh, Sometimes it's a good idea to have an introductory class uh, for, for, for giving some kind of Swedish knowledge before you go out in, in, into the ordinary classes. But I would like to uh, warn for uh, stopping uh, the students' uh, learning uh, in other subjects and saying that since you can't speak Swedish on a very high level so that you can use it for the education, you, we stop with maths, we stop with uh, social science, we stop with... Uh, natural sciences and so on. We need to continue teaching and instructing those subjects, even if the student 
Swedish is not on the level uh, of their, their, their knowledge in these subjects. And therefore, we need to use uh, all the different teachers in the different subjects need to have uh, a language developing teaching in their subject. So the maths teacher has to know how do I define and use concepts so that also a person who hasn't got the language strong can develop an understanding for that. But we also need to use the student's uh, first language as a support, as a bridge into continuing uh, the teaching in, 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 the, in Sweden and in the new country. So we need to support them in the first language and use mother tongue teachers uh, also as support in the different uh, subjects. The next thing to do is to give them more time uh, these students need more time than the Swedish students, so we need to build paths from, example, from upper secondary level into adult education. But not say that well, uh, you're 20, you must stop in in ed educational system. But we must path make continuous uh, paths for these elderly uh, students to continue into adult education. So start when you're uh, uh, in, in the upper secondary level, but to continue into adult education and without uh, a gap there between the different uh, parts of our education system. Okay. We also need more time when, when it comes to summer schools and things like that. We have put more money into the municipalities for them to, to be able to, for these uh, uh, refugee students to have more time. And the third thing I would like to mention is that we have tried to to pick out, we have vocational upper secondary programs in the Swedish system uh, that are really uh, regarded as necessary by the employers in order to give jobs uh, to young people. Uh, but it will take a very long time for these refugee students to get to that level. So we have formed uh, special vocational exams, you could call it, uh, with more uh, vocational uh, uh, courses that we know that the labor market is interested in, uh, but also that can later be built up into a full exam on the upper secondary level for these students. So it's not a, it's not a blind alley, but it's a possibility to go on. But it's a possibility to perhaps in a relatively short time get the courses that you <clears throat> need to establish yourself in the labor market. And then you can continue with the more theoretical subjects. And for example, subjects like English, that is compulsory in, in our uh, exams. But it's very hard for students who come to Sweden and have never studied English before. So these are some of the, the strategies that we try to use to improve, uh, in, improve the educational paths, for, uh, late, especially for the late arrived uh, refugees uh, in Sweden. But we look forward very much to hear from experiences and knowledge from also the other Nordic countries. Thank you so much, Eric. I also hear you saying that uh, it's, it seems like all the teachers actually need to have uh, a, a more, uh, they need to be upgraded more towards Swedish as a secondary language comp uh, competence. Uh, did I understand you right? Swedish as second language. And I would like to say uh, that what we can see in the educational system is that uh, I sometimes use the phrase the language capital <laughs> is crucial for success and the language capital is not only if you speak Swedish or Arabic or whatever uh, uh, language you speak uh, but it's the richness of the language it's the the, uh, uh, the ability to have different kind of concepts uh, the the richness to have a, a abstract language so we can see the same mechanisms, uh, language mechanisms uh, for uh, labor class Swedish <laughs> young people as for immigrant uh, you, young people uh, with a low educational background. So in, after seven or eight years in Sweden, we can see it's the class background, it's the educational background of the parents that gives the result, the different results. And okay. since we have bigger differences, if you look at the refugees, we have big, bigger differences between their parents' re uh, educational background than what we have in the Nordic countries for, for people who are born here. The parents in, in, 
in Sweden or Norway or Denmark are generally have a relatively good education, but the differences are much bigger if you look in the refugees group. Mm. Not okay, so that Eric. every refugee has a very poor educational background. We can see those who have extremely high <laughs> educational background. Mm. For example, from Iran, uh, they are doing very well, well in, the, in the Swedish school system. So thank you, you. thank you, Eric. The language capital. That's that's uh, my point. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we are uh, going on. We, we, we leave Sweden for a moment and we go to Denmark, to Alan Krasnick. And you are in Copenhagen today, right? Are you with us, Alan? Hello. Yes, Alan, Alan, uh, I, ju I, ju I just have to ask you before you, you go on. Um, we are we are so busy comparing our countries these days, uh, not least in the COVID situation. Tell me, why is it so important to compare our countries dealing with, with the problems? Because I think we can learn a lot by looking into countries uh, that are uh, similar to us in many ways, but also do some things differently. And uh, what they do differently might be something to inspire for our decision makers and our practice. So I think this is a crucial learning uh, um, process. To learn from others is what we all do. Okay, and uh, you have learned a lot from these five years. Please, please tell us uh, briefly what, what the outcome is. Yes, uh, well, our project was uh, started uh, five years ago with uh, some uh, quite ambitious goals with a focus on first uh, how to how social and health inequities developed during the formative years in young refugees. Secondly, we wanted to find out how social dimensions in health are interrelated and associated with key areas of welfare policy. And finally, we wanted to identify welfare policies that may promote health and social economic equity in young refugees compared with the uh, majority population. <clears throat> the concept of equity is a key <clears throat> for CAGE. And what does it really mean? Uh, when we look into the dimension of health, uh, it has been uh, defined very nicely by Margaret uh, Whitehead, as uh, shown on this slide. It says that equity in health <clears throat> implies that ideally everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential. More pragmatically, that none should be disadvantaged from achieving this potential if it allowing attainment of full potential uh, if uh, at all possible and for everyone. And uh, then you may ask why the Nordic approach? Well, the Nordic countries exactly as mentioned are uh, very similar in many ways regarding majority populations, regarding the general welfare policies, uh, but there are also major differences regarding migration patterns, regarding migrant and the refugee policies, and there are comparable registered data, and we had a history of close collaboration. Uh, as you see, we have um, partners, uh, project teams in all the four countries involved, which are really teams of excellence in the field that we are working. And um, of course, I uh, have also to uh, mention that the, Nor the North Force, the Nordic Research Council, has been very uh, generous in providing our financial uh, basis to do all this uh, work. Um, we um, are focusing on three major dimensions uh, of our Nordic welfare states on education, on employment, and on health. And these dimensions for everyone, they are closely interrelated, as we know, but they're mostly studied independently. So we look at them all. For refugees, the three dimensions are also strongly related to uh, factors in before they migrated, 
during their migration and after their migration. And uh, uh, we are, of course, in our project, primarily focusing on what is happening uh, after uh, migration. And we are studying this using a mix of study designs uh, with, all, with a focus on equity. Comparative policy studies, <clears throat> looking into the policy frameworks, comparative register-based studies, looking into national inequalities, and cross-country comparisons, and then qualitative studies in individual countries, <clears throat> focusing on education, labor market, and uh, health. Uh, Alan, can we yes. save that the last picture uh, until the, the discussion panel, please? I would like to, to come back to that picture later on, if that's okay with you. Okay, so I drop this one now. That's yeah, one drop one. that drop that one and we'll go on with Signe because I believe that she's not far away from you right yes, now, right? right. Signe is right beside me. Okay, so, uh, great. Thank, thank you so much, Alan. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, our schedule is, as I said before, it's pretty tight. And you already mentioned the three keywords here on your study, which is health, education and labor. And with those three words, I would like to introduce Signe uh, smith Järvelund. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for this nice presentation. So I will look into the integration of refugees into active dynamics of health, education and employment. So due to the refugee immigration flow, the society weave of the Nordic welfare state has changed over the last couple of decades. During the period 2006 to 2018, more than 400,000 people have been granted residency as refugees in the Nordic countries. About two thirds of these have settled in Sweden, as you can see in this figure. The most prevalent countries of origin of the refugees arrived in the same period in the Nordic countries were Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Somalia, other Africa, Syria, and stateless. But as you can also see from this picture, the composition of the refugee population by our origin differed by Nordic country of residence. The Nordic countries may have a great interest in promoting social and economic equality of refugees to increase social coherence, secure the labor force and economic growth, decrease spending on social welfare services, and also to honor human rights commitments. In recent political trends in the Nordic countries has been focusing on employability as a key to integration. The importance of educational outcomes, unemployment and health has been less considered, even though poor health, poor education, and, leave, and weak labor market attachment is likely to interact and reinforce each other. The conditions in the host country, including the policies affecting refugee children's life chances, are often politically determined and hence changeable. The Nordic countries share historical, cultural, social and welfare structure. But at the same time, within the domain of integration and immigration, there were substantial differences during the time of the CAGE study. According to the Migration Integration Policy Index, Denmark had far, far more restrictive integration and immigration policies compared with the other Nordic countries, with Sweden at the other end with a far more liberal immigration policy. Recently, the trend is rather that all the Nordic countries seem to be somewhat following Denmark's fairly strict immigration policy. The CAGE project has approached the study of young refugees' early life courses in Nordic countries through a many lens perspective that appreciates the multifaceted nature of integration processes. The concept of integration has been defined and interpreted in many different ways. Definitions have often centered around integration as a mutual process. One definition states that integration can be seen as social processes of interaction, personal and social change among individuals and institutions that connect the individual and groups with each other <coughs> to form an overall unity. Not only the individual characteristics influence the nature, speed, and direction of these processes, but also the wider social context, including national and policy, and local policy and initiatives play an important role. The adaptive model of integration processes, originally developed by Spencer and Chalsley, illustrates the main and their characteristics that facilitates or impedes 
integration processes. The processes take place at local and national level, but are also infected by the individual's previous migration history and ties to the country of origin. Experiences and practices and understandings in different domains may interact and influence each other. The CAGE project has primarily focused on the domains that include the individual social factors in the country of residence and policy at the national and local level, which are highlighted in this figure. From the aggregated level of national policies and the register-based studies to the context-rich case studies in school, workplaces, and healthcare cities, the CAGE project has shed light on how such challenges play out in the Nordic <coughs> countries, and also the importance of tackling these challenges for the post-settlement context to facilitate the integration of young refugee newcomers. The institutions, communities, and individuals of society must be geared to include these new members of society. Integration is a long process of mutual adaptation that starts right from the day the children arrive in our countries. The goal of equality in our welfare states presupposes an understanding that health, education, and employment are interrelated, and that investing in one area is likely to yield gains in other areas. Thanks. Thank you, Signe. And you will be part of the discussion panel uh, later on. And the email address, I just to remind you all, is ask at uh, nordregio.org. Thank, Thank you so much, Singh, again. And now we'll be uh, speed dating three researchers, each of one presenting a specific aspect uh, in the field of education. Please welcome Andrea Danlevi of Stockholm, Lutin de Val Pastor in Copenhagen, and from Norway we uh, present Ketil Eide. Starting with Andrea. outcomes and trajectories. One is a quantitative register-based cross-country comparison study of key educational outcomes, uh, which I will be presenting, and then my colleagues uh, Lutin and Keta will follow and give an overview of the qualitative ethnographically oriented study on educational and psychosocial transitions among young refugees in Norway. So in terms of the comparative register study, what we wanted to do here really was harmonize uh, the population-based register data that we have available uh, in the Nordic countries to assess educational outcomes among children and youth from Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. And we had two sort of overarching main aims here. First, to assess for differences in refugees' educational outcomes by their Nordic country of residence and also to determine the extent to which we might see any inequalities in educational outcomes when comparing refugees and the native-born majority populations. And so we've defined these uh, study populations quite specifically. Uh, for refugee children, we define them as those children who um, were aged 0 to 17 years at the time of their migration and who received residency in one of the four Nordic countries between 1986 and 2005. And then we also had native-born majority reference populations. So these were age-matched native-born children who also had two uh, native-born parents. So this just gives an overview of our refugee study populations in terms of absolute numbers. And as you can see from the slide, uh, the absolute numbers of children in Denmark and Norway were quite similar. Uh, Sweden by far had the largest number of refugee children included in the study population, and Finland the smallest absolute number. So I'm going to give a very short overview of three sort of key educational outcomes that represent important milestones uh, in an educational trajectory of, uh, of an individual. And we'll start with school performance and compulsory education. So this slide shows the average school grades uh, among refugee children by their age of arrival. Uh, the scores, the average scores for girls are shown on the left and for boys on the right. And the blue dashed line in the figure represents um, the average score among the native-born majority populations across all of the Nordic countries. 
So what we can see here basically is that overall, um, average grades among refugees uh, were lower than the, their native born majority counterparts in all of the countries. Um, and we do see evidence of a performance gradient by age of arrival in all of the countries, whereby those children who arrived um, at younger ages tended to have higher uh, average scores than those who arrived at later ages. And we also see that in terms of cross-country comparisons, Sweden, uh, children uh, residing in Sweden tended to have the highest average scores, but they also, we also see the largest um, age at arrival gradients um, in Sweden as well. Moving on to uh, upper secondary school completion. So this figure then shows the proportion of upper secondary educational attainment by age 25 when comparing native born majority populations and refugees uh, by their age at arrival. So again, here we do see uh, some evidence of a persistence of inequality between the native born majority populations uh, and refugees. We see that the highest proportion uh, of completed upper secondary education by age 25 was observed uh, in Sweden. And we do see some evidence of this persistence of an age at arrival gradient in terms uh, of completion of upper secondary education, but it is much less pronounced than that which we see uh, when looking at average grades uh, from compulsory school. Uh, and finally, I just want to end uh, with a, a figure showing uh, the proportion of higher educational attainment by age 30 uh, when we compare native born majority populations and refugees, um, all of whom have completed upper secondary education by age 25. So when we look at this, we see that rates of completion were actually quite similar when comparing uh, the native born majority populations and refugees uh, in both Denmark and in Norway and to a somewhat lesser degree uh, in Sweden. Um, however, we do see uh, a lower uh, proportion of completed higher education uh, among refugees in Finland. And we can talk about these results uh, in more detail later this afternoon at the educational workshop. And I will turn it over now to my colleague, uh, Lutin. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I'll uh, proceed immediately as time is limited. The qualitative study, Transitions upon Resettlement in Norway, here after Turin, is based on interviews and observations in five upper secondary schools three in the Greater Oslo region and two in southeastern Norway. The people interviewed are 46 teachers and other school staff, as well as 47 refugee students aged between 16 and 24. The study has been conducted in collaboration between research teams from the Norwegian Center for Violence and Traumatic Stress Studies and the University of Southeastern Norway. I'll have to this clicker is <laughs> me some problems. Yeah. Next one. Then I proceed. In the study, we focus on two kinds of transitions recently resettled refugee students have to relate to. These are educational transitions upon entering Norwegian school, as for example, adjusting to the new school environment and learning a new language, and the psychosocial transitions resulting from the interaction between the psychological aspects of past and present experience of being a refugee and current social relations. The study uh, overall objective was to provide better insight into the educational and psychosocial challenges refugee young people face upon resettlement and how these challenges may influence their pathways into education. I'm having little problem that the my <laughs> that the clicker is disappearing. Yes. So there is some time in between every slide, but now I'm here. I'm now focusing on what are the findings of our study. Newly arrived refugees are a very heterogeneous group of students with respect to age, ethnicity, language, flight background, previous education, and their current life situation. So, consequently, upon entering school, they will have very different educational and psychosocial needs and resources. Age at arrival is a decisive factor for school completion, and most students in, were, that were interviewed uh, were late arrivals, meaning arriving at a late school age. 
and had limited and or interrupted previous education. Late arriving newcomers face considerable challenges, especially when they, after a short period of residency, are supposed to enter mainstream upper secondary education. Educational provisions at, separate, at uh, upper secondary schools aiming at facilitating good transitions are promising initiatives with both pros and cons, of course. Sorry, as I said, my clicker disappears all the time. <laughs> this is the next, I continue. Uh, the schools and teachers involved did not always know how to relate to the diverse educational, psychosocial and social needs of refugee students. In the interviews, the school staff focused most on educational issues. The uh, interviewed students expressed to be happy about the new opportunities attending school provided them. However, they reported different levels of contentment with the educational provisions offered. This appears to have reflected different levels of their teachers' qualifications and competence in teaching newcomers. Broadly speaking, the findings suggest that there is a contrast between the schools in the greater Oslo region and the schools in the smaller municipalities in southeastern Norway, in terms of whether school staff have adequate qualifications and experience to work with newly arrived refugee students. So I continue. No? Okay. The findings also point to a policy practice gap. That is a noticeable difference between national education policy principles versus local implementation in schools. Schools and individual teachers seem to have varying and sometimes insufficient knowledge of how to implement national policy principles into classroom practice. For example, the principle of adapted language teaching for newcomers involving teaching of and in Norwegian as a second language, as well as bilingual subject teaching, is frequently not or insufficiently implemented. Increased resources in terms of teaching competence and uh, my gosh, uh, financial support are needed here. Some reflections. The increasing diversity in Norwegian schools plays a substantial demands on school systems, schools and teachers. The findings emphasize the decisive importance of a school approach, uh, which is a whole school approach and having adequate diversity and refugee competence. It's crucial to invest in preparing school leaders, school staff and teachers for more diverse, diverse school populations by means of pre-service and in-service training. And then as a final slide, can we, can we I'd like to show you this picture, which I took in the Satari refugee camp in Jordan. We should not only consider how well refugee young people adapt to the Norwegian school system, but also how well Norwegian schools adapt to young refugees' specific needs. And then I'll ask, should we offer young refugees the short or the long ladder of support in reading, reaching their full educational potential. Then I'll give the word to, uh, to Katil. Welcome to further discussions later on. Yes, and I will continue. Um, I will talk about uh, teacher perspectives on this, um, uh, in this project. Uh, and uh, I will start with uh, three dilemmas uh, that the teachers uh, experienced. Uh, and I shall highlight just one of them, but, but uh, one, one is uh, the balancing between educational and psychosocial demands, which is a challenge. And also seeing the individual refugee student versus group level challenges. And uh, the third, which I will have to we talk to now is sustaining motivation versus re relating to limited prerequisites for educational aspirations. So I will talk about aspirations. So, because 
the teachers find it difficult to uh, to uh, give negative assessments and low grades over a long pe- time or period because they don't want to to, to the students to become demotivated, and and we we just uh, do it uh, find these. Sorry, it was too much. Um, what what these teachers are talking about is that uh, we call it biding time with close strangers. It is about uh, these students, the teachers find uh, motivated. They are very motivated. They are interested. They want to learn. They ask a lot. And they are also polite and sup- sympathetic. So in a way, they are close to the teachers. In another way, they are also strange uh, because the teacher says they have many holes, they have not learned to learn, limited prior education, Norwegian language skills are difficult, familiarity with Norwegian culture and student role expectations, and they also wonder if they are traumatized during war and flight. So in a way, they are strangers. Uh, and how this challenge of, of this uh, balancing between uh, to keep them motivated and, and uh, to, to find solutions for their ambitions. Um, we we w- was analyzing how these teachers make sense of this dissonance of being close strangers. Uh, and, let me see. So in a way, the teachers see that it's unrealistic for students to succeed academically but they do not inform them about their assessments. Just more like you have to have a dream to strive for. Uh, and of course the teachers are loyal to policy goals and increasing completion rates and persuade students to choose vocational education programs irrespective or of their aspirations. And the, student, the, the teacher says we do talk very positively about vocational education for most of the students and also that they are successful in persuading. They are not. There are none who have applied for anything we disagree with for the coming school years. They listen to the advice we give. So, in a way, and they are waiting to, to patiently for students to get it. They will be integrated, and and so on. So, just to end up this uh, with some implication, maybe implication for this. Uh, of course, this is the limit limited uh, project from some school i don't i cannot say that <laughs> all teachers and schools are, are, are doing this um, <clears throat> as uh, we found in this but it's quite interesting to find the social praxis which the the teachers uh, are telling us about so a possible implication of these findings is that uh, a kind of informed choice between accepting lowered aspirations uh, or making an extra effort and risk failing uh, for these students or quitting uh, upper secondary school and option for a job instead. So uh, this is a finding could be a possible way of looking at how do teachers talk to students uh, in, a, uh, in a way that they can have informed choice between these uh, alternatives. And so, <clears throat> just for an uh, invitation to uh, the, the um, web, to, for the um, workshop uh, afterwards, we can discuss all these uh, questions. And, and Lutin and Andrea will chair this uh, workshop. So, thank you. Thank you, thank so, you much, so much, Ketil. And, and uh, uh, thank you all for your brief presentations. We are now going to zoom out from the Nordic perspective just for a moment. Uh, we have uh, with us today from Paris, Lucy Cherna of the OECD. Hello, Lucy. Yes, I'm very, we're happy that you're with us today. And um, we just wanted to check up, uh, sort of zoom out of our bubble and to see what you think uh, about what you have heard so far. Um, 
Are you surprised or do the results differ from the rest of the world in any aspect, would you say? I think the results are quite um, consistent, at least with the OECD uh, analysis we have done. So we've done quite a lot of analysis looking at PISA data. Um, we are quite jealous that uh, you have such rich data, actually, the registered data, because in many countries um, you can only say if a student has an immigrant background and you don't know whether they've they came as refugees or the parents or whether they came as, for instance, labor migrants or family family migrants. So we can't, we can't zoom in in such a detail, but the results are quite consistent, uh, both actually the quantitative and the qualitative data that refugees are very heterogeneous groups and their, their needs differ. So it's also hard to say um, where the, the outcomes that the students have, it really can differ quite a bit on their background, on their age of arrival, which in our analysis also comes out as a very strong factor, although we only look at before 12 years and after 12 years. Um, and in terms of the outcomes and uh, completion, um, I think that's also quite consistent that generally refugees or first generation immigrants have worse outcomes than native students, but it can vary a lot um, across countries. So in many European countries, there is worse outcomes, academic outcomes, although in countries that have very strong um, and very different immigration systems, um, such as Canada, Australia, or uh, New Zealand, or, or UK, the uh, outcomes can be uh, much better sometimes than the, than the native students. Um, as also, I think, presentation also in the chapter is quite clear that it's important to look beyond just academic outcomes, or, but also look at the psychosocial outcomes, uh, which can be very important and go very much hand in hand. So you might have very good academic outcomes as a refugee, or uh, but you might be on the, for instance, the sense of belonging to the school community or anxiety, you might be doing very poorly. So if you don't look at both of them, the student, you think the student is doing relatively well, but actually he or she is not doing well at all in a, as a overall. So it's very important to look at it. And I think two more things I'd like to mention is that comes out also in the presentation is this policy practice gap. And um, that's, you might have legislation which is supposed to uh, support integration and has, there are lots of policies in place, but actually at the implementation, it can vary a lot across schools, but across also different regions, for instance. So it's important to also examine that and also support those that are perhaps not implementing it or do not understand how to implement it well enough. And I think the whole school approach is also something that comes out in our own work, that it's important not to also give just the responsibility to the teacher, for instance, that they are responsible for integrating refugee students, but everybody is responsible, the school leaders, the parents, the, the students, the whole community working also beyond the schools with the municipalities and, uh, and with the regions. So overall, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Do, uh, I guess that you all discuss what the whole world is discussing right now, and that's the coronavirus. How would you say that uh, the, the virus affects the, the group of young non-natives when, when it comes to labor and education, Lucy? Well, it's a, it's a typical time for, for everyone, all students, but I think um, especially for the vulnerable students like refugees, but they're also students, for instance, with special education needs, it's a very even more difficult time. Um, because I think what came out also very strongly in the presentation is that you have strong support usually from the teachers who are trying to help, um, providing feedback, being a support person and a um, kind of also a role model. But when you are, when the school's closed in many of the countries, refugee students in a way lost perhaps this link. Of course, you have some online teaching and many countries in Canada have been uh, promoting that and, and very successful, but it's not the same. I mean, in, in some cases, refugees don't have internet access or they don't have good uh, learning conditions at home. Um, so that's already uh, almost a kind of a step back. Another, of course, challenge is also that you might, as refugees, you might not have the psychosocial support that they might have in schools. And for schools counselors, also having been part of a community with their friends. Um, with, the, with the other teachers, the other school staff. So it takes a, actually much more effort to, to kind of uh, keep up this sense of belonging and also kind of to keep the motivation of the students. I think that's an important aspect as well, that many of the refugees and students are very interested. 
they might be lacking the skills. Um, and um, so it's important that they don't lose the perspective. Many of them have experienced already interrupted education uh, in their journey uh, to, the, to the host country. And now, again, they might have experienced interruptions and uh, also kind of may perhaps some of the aspects of trauma or anxiety have come up again. Um, and okay. so it's also important to kind of keep their motivation, but also continue providing the support because um, not, we have seen in the presentation that not as many are able to reach, for instance, tertiary education levels, and there's much more effort also, uh, also to that. So is thank a, thank is you. Another... It is actually for all of us. Thank you so much, Lucy Cherna of the OECD, and we are moving on from Paris to Iceland, and uh, we... Um... Iceland is not actually a part of this study, but uh, today Iceland is one of the Nordic countries with the largest number of refugees per capita. And uh, Ella, Ella, Edda Olofsdottir, you have been engaged with the welcoming of immigrants from day one. Is that correct? Very welcome, he Edda. Hello. Um, listen, we are a bit uh, after our schedule, uh, but uh, let's have a few comments from you. And I would, I would like, like to start, start asking, asking you, why, why is it important for you uh, on Iceland today to, to listen and to learn and adapt, uh, uh, cons uh, comparing to what the other Nordic countries are, are up to when it comes to this question? Well, <laughs> I just want to start telling that I'm a big fan of Nordic cooperation and I think it's really important for us living in Iceland. We are very few. In whole Iceland there are only 365,000 people living here. So it's like a t town in, in the rest of, uh, of, of Europe. And, and we are always a little bit behind the, the development in, in compared to the Scandinavian countries. So what we are seeing now for the last two years, a lot of uh, refugees, asylum seekers coming to Iceland, and for the, especially for the last two, two years. And, and for example, I'm working in Reykjavik city, and we have, uh, for the last two years, we have been receiving uh, over 670 refugees, and amongst them are 150 children. So I think uh, the CAGE project is really important for us because uh, the findings and the results, we can use that and learn because we don't have to invent, invent the wheel. And, we, and, and, and I think we can use this in, in our work. And, and we, yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm, <clears throat> I think this is so important and, and, and listening to, because we are a little bit behind. But okay, really, but you're really you're, you're with us today, even, even though, though you, you, you feel that you're a bit behind, behind you're you're still, still with us the whole, the whole day, day uh, I gather, uh, Edda. So thank you so much for your comment from the Icelandic point of view. And uh, back to Sweden now, and we are talking. Uh, we are going to talk about labor, uh, the labor market, with Carl Gufeng of the Stockholm University. And uh, as seeing the Smith's uh, Järvelund said er earlier today, Carl, uh, employability is a key to integration. And um, unemployment is actually increasing as a result of the coronavirus. And for our young refugees, Carl, um, the situation may be even more se serious. Is that correct? Absolutely. This is something that we have looked into, of course, in the quantitative labor market studies that we have conducted. But of course, we are not able to cover the current situation going on right now with the data okay. that we have. Mm -hmm. But you, but have, you have some other uh, presentation from the study to present mm. today? Yes, I have. Um, actually, today I will talk a little bit about the labor, out, labor market outcome studies, but I'm also going to focus on the policy studies that we have conducted. The work that I've done within the CAGE project has focused on the labor market and together with Evelina Lutinen and Andrea Dunlevy and others, have been involved in both the policy analysis and the quantitative studies of labor market outcomes. And there is not much time now to go into the details of, of these quantitative studies, but I will end my short presentation here with, with a, in my opinion, most important graph from the quantitative analysis. And we will also have some time to talk about them in the workshop later. But 
My focus in this presentation will be on the policies related to labor market integration of refugees and on what I would regard to be a rather radical discursive shift in the way integration and labor market participation are framed in the Nordics and perhaps in, in Europe as a whole. Because when we started the work within the CAGE project five years ago, the most common question that I got when I told people that we are interested in, in policies aiming to facilitate the young refugees entry to the Nordic labor markets, that question was what works? which policies work. And I, I think it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a really understandable and it's a relevant question, not only because it would be really nice to get them to be able to give a straightforward answer to that question, the kind of a powerful package of policies that cuts the Gordian knot of labor market integration, but also because finding a good answer to that question has been of such great importance within the context of the Nordic welfare state. So, I mean, working age individuals contribution to the welfare state by the fruits of their labor has for a very long time been seen as a prerequisite for inclusion in that very same welfare state. And ever since migration rates increased in the Nordic countries in the past century, the focus has been to provide immigrants with two things. One, the formal right to work in the country and two, effective introduction programs of active labor market policies that would speed up the process of labor market integration. So I think when people ask what works, they usually refer to these active labor market policies. And as I've indicated already, it's not easy to give a clear answer to that question. Um, there are studies, a lot of studies, that indicate short-term positive effects of, for example, subsidized employment within the private sector. But these policies have also been criticized for a number of reasons, both by employer organizations and by trade unions. So it's tricky. Um, this is basically the starting point for the analysis of labor market integration of refugees, a focus on the right to work and on the not very clear effect of disputed active labor market policies with the aim to integrate refugees into the Nordic countries and into the Nordic welfare state. But what we have seen in the past years is a gradual but quite rapid transition away from this way of formulating the main policy issue. And I've tried to illustrate this here in this PowerPoint slide. Since 2015, and now we're moving into the second step in this illustration, we have seen that the demands on the individual immigrant to work for their own sustenance have increased. Although there has been a strong focus on active labor market policies for a long time, these have traditionally been supplemented by financial support measures, but in this step, these payments are heavily reduced. And this approach goes in line with the general implementation of so-called workfare policies and are quite explicitly aimed to reduce costs related to migration. And the third step in this graph, um, it's illustrating the transition to a policy environment connecting labor market participation not only to the economic means of living, but also to the possibility of long-term residence in the country. And this development can be illustrated by the situation in Sweden, where formerly the need for protection as defined in the Migration Act was a sufficient cause for permanent residence uh, in the country. Um, but now, from 2016, Permanent residence permits are only granted refugees with a need for protection and a job with a certain level of income. So we have moved into, into a conditionality of residence that we did not have before. In the final step in this illustration is reflecting the general trend of a more restrictive migration policy, which we see in many countries. And just like Signe said before, in the Nordic countries, perhaps Denmark has taken this the furthest by implementing a number of reforms framed as a paradigm shift of the domestic migration policy with a very clear ambition to keep the duration of refugee residence in Denmark to a short-term stay. We have now moved away from a situation in which in refugee integration is, is seen as a necessary or even desirable policy goal. And discursively, this has been very clear in the Danish context, uh, relabeling of integration programs, for example, to self-sufficiency and repatriation programs and so on. So it, it remains to be seen what kind of effects this will have for migrant lives in the future. So this is 
basically a description, a very short uh, description of a development of migration and labor market policy that is in many ways intertwined. And it has taken place to various degrees in the Nordic countries. One consequence of this shift is that we may have reasons to ask new questions um, around new concerns. So if we used to ask ourselves which policies work, which policies work, this, this might not be as relevant in a new policy environment that is actually not aiming for refugee integration. Um, one major concern in, in relation to step two and three, in which wage labor becomes such a strong existential necessity for individual immigrants and sometimes a condition for their residence in the country, is that we may see uh, refugees seeing themselves being forced to accept very poor working conditions or low wages or other very disadvantageous circumstances that is part of a, um, of a precarious labor market. And the way the final step of a more restrictive migration policy will have an impact on labor market participation, it remains to be seen. Perhaps the labor market is not the biggest concern here, but I, I think it's fair to assume that any policy that actively steps away from the aim of integration will not contribute to improved integration in the area of the labor market, I think. Many could agree on that. And this might lead to people remaining effectively restricted in their daily lives. So future research would really look, look, have to look into how this affects immigrants and their children. But I want to end this presentation uh, with my, my, my idea of the most important graph from the quantitative labor market studies. And uh, it's a quite busy slide here, but I just wanted to show you this because it shows labor market participation at age 30 among refugees and native origin people by country of residence and level of education. And we have heard already level of education is important. The two first groups on the left hand side, they represent refugees and native origin people with completed upper secondary education. And the two other groups on the right hand side, side represent the same groups, but without upper secondary education. So I know that when people ask about what works, which policies work, they usually refer to more short-term measures. But I think that this graph here can give you an answer if you accept a more long-term perspective because of the big difference comparing the two first groups with the last two groups in terms of labor market participation among refugees and natives. Education works. Education will have a great effect on the chances for young refugees to participate in the Nordic labor markets. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you much, Carl. Carl. And, and further, further discussion, discussion in the panel in less than an hour. Thank you so much, Carl. And uh, before we move on to Finland and uh, talk to your colleague Eli Heikile, uh, we would like to introduce you to a young uh, woman uh, living in Finland. Her name is Natasha Mahmoud Mohamed. She came to Finland from Somalia when she was 15 years old. And today she's working as a nurse, and this is her story. Hi, I'm Nasteha Mahmoud. I'm 20 years old, and I'm originally from Somalia, but now I live in Finland. Um, I have moved to Finland when I was 14, 15, when I was turning 15, back in 2015. And um, when I moved here, I was put into a language learning school. And after that, I continued studying uh, upper compressive school from 7th, 8th and 9th. And then after that, I went to a vocational school and I'm studying now. I'm third year practical nurse now. And um, I have been working as a practical nurse since 2019 summer. And I have been working in a lot of different fields. I, I've worked with uh, kids, old age people, handicapped people, and home services. But now I work as a home caregiver. I visit people at home and give them medicines, uh, help them with food, uh, maybe if they want to take a shower, or if they want to go out, or like if they want to buy something from the internet. Um, how did I choose to become a practical nurse? I've always liked working with people who wouldn't, who couldn't help help themselves. So 
that's why I got into this field and I would like to continue from this field. So I thought it would be easier for me to work as a practical nurse and then it, and then I could continue working, um, finding a job. Um, my first job was with a kid. So I was an internship with a daycare and it was like six weeks. And after the six weeks, they asked me if I could go and work with them for like after my school or a few few hours before my school starts as a gig job or like on and off job. So I liked working with the kids, but I didn't like it as much as I like my right now where I work. So after that, um, I got a summer job, which I applied through the internet. So I got a call from a couple of places and it was a home caregiver work. So I want to get. I went to. I went there to give a interview, and after that, I got the job, and I worked there during the summer two thousand nineteen, from May to August, and after I worked there during the summer, the head of the place I worked gave me this application that said I could go on work with the Turku City home caregivers. So I applied there. And now I can go anywhere in the city, wherever there's a need for a home caregiver. I would just take the job from the internet and go to that place and, and give my services or like home caregiving there. So that's how I got the where the place I work now. But um, have I ever faced difficulty in getting a job? I think I wouldn't say I've felt any difficulties because I got my jobs very easily because of my school, the internship place I was in, and my summer job. Because of that, I got into a lot of other places to work in. Uh, during After my uh, summer job, I, I have also tried working with handicapped people and also with old age people. But I think home caregiving is my thing. I like it more. Um, do I have plans to continue? my studies yes i would like to continue uh my studies i would like to study occupational therapy uh in helsinki hopefully i would like to learn it in english and if not i would like also to study social services i like both of them because i would like to work in the future with um international organizations like WHO, so I would like to continue. So, Elli Heikele, Finland, are you with us? Hello, Elli. Are you here? Hi, welcome. So, Elli, um, uh, in what way would you say that uh, the Nastasha story differ from the, the refugees, uh, uh, the, the non-natives non taking part in your study? study? Yes, I think Nastasha shows this inspiration to advance in her life, educating herself, having working experience, and also having plans for the further education. Because all youth have these uh, dreams of the educational background, what they want to study. And of course, many youth have uh, dream jobs where they would like to enter in the future when they mm -hmm. finalize their studies. I think she is very success. She is showing the successful story of this kind of from education to the labor markets. Absolutely, I do agree. So now you're going to uh, go on with, with uh, present some of the results of your study. So please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. We have been conducted in this research project. I don't see I didn't see the change of the slide, but hopefully it has changed. Yes, yes, it has. Okay, thank you. So we have conducted this research two-way labor market integration perspectives of the youth with the refugee background and employers in Finland. And we have had Evelina Lutinen and Nita Thum 
uh, doing this uh, qualitative uh, labor market study for GAGE. And its aim has to be has been investigate the labor market integration experiences first of the youth with the refugee background. We have the 13 interviews, then employers uh, of employing refugees and immigrants, 12 interviews. And um, thirdly, we had other experts, 13, who, who were working with refugees and employment matters. Totally 38 interviews all around Finland. And uh, the analysis had been done by life story interviews, analyzed using a narrative approach, thematic interviews, analyzed with content analysis. Next slide. And um, what about the performance in the labor markets? What we have seen and what we know, there are the paths from education to, to uh, employment. Those paths are not linear. There, there can be the situation that person enters from the education to the labor markets, but then maybe to unemployment, maybe to, to further education and back to the labor markets. So it, it has not been linear. And um, these youngsters, they have found employment through various mechanisms, what we explain in the report and personal networks. They, they can be looking, for example, open vacancies or from public uh, employment and business services, the jobs and so on, or maybe even going to ask from the employers and these personal networks, friends and parents Maybe parents work in a business, they could have a job from there. But there are also these periods of unemployment. And these they have faced quite difficult and even traumatic. We notice in this study of, of these 13 interviewed that 10, 10 of them were experiencing, experiencing unemployment during their lifetime. That short a time because they are young, but already unemployment experiences. And when there were these interviews conducted, four were unemployed at that moment. And uh, there have been this kind of transition, as it explained, several sort of unemployment periods typically. And what are the reasons? Only a few mentioning here lack of work experience, interpre interrupted education, conducting unrewarding trainings, not leading to the work. And some, of course, this unemployment, it, there are low esteem feelings, self-reported depression. It has been shown also that, or the, uh, told that these um, traumatic um, experiences, they can affect the performance in the labor markets. Next slide. And then these barriers and factors determining recruitment of refugees. Um, there, there can be these skills what, what are lacking. For example, very often is said language. There can be lack of work experience or maybe not getting the job after training. And um, cultural, cultural feathers can affect. Also employers can think about this, that they, can, they might think that they don't understand everything. Who knows? The main point is, however, to hire the best, not to differentiate between nationalities. And, um, and this, uh, some, some wish to hire refugees and immigrants um, because they bring value to the companies and working places. Because the world is multicultural, it is not one-sided. We need all kinds of people over here. What about staying in the labor markets? It is like what these employers are saying that when the job is done well, one can keep it. So the performance is very important. And um, of course, these good employers, they can be recommended by the employers to other employers if they don't have work anymore. But there can be this kind of chain saying that one employer can say that, OK, I have a very talented person here, please, if you could have a job for this person, person. And all, all of these employers in this research were very pleased with the refugee immigrant background in employees. And all are thinking that they are willing to 
employ also in the future. So it is a very good sign. And our populations are aging in, in, in Nordic countries and all in other countries too, outside Nordic countries. So there will be for surely need for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellie. And um, we are now moving on to discuss the, f the third uh, theme of this study, and that is health and health reception. And uh, with us here today is Anders Jarn. Anders, are you with us? Can you hear me? Welcome. So, um, Anders, we, we will be seeing you a lot because you will also be taking uh, part of the discussion panel. And uh, we're running a bit late, late so, so I just say, say welcome, welcome and uh, please, please let us know uh, your resume of your findings. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon and welcome to my office in, at CHESS in Stockholm. I'm going to uh, briefly uh, report on three pieces of work from, from the CAGE project, um, two that were made by the Danish team and one which is a collective effort to which all the CAGE teams have contributed. Um, the first piece is an analysis of the health reception policies in the Nordic countries. Um, it, it's a, a historical overview where uh, the different kinds of health reception programs that have been in place since the, since the 1980s. And there are many similarities. It's obvious that the countries here have inspired each other. Um, and so since the 1980s, all four countries have had established health reception programs, which primarily has come, uh, focused on infectious disease and to some extent also of acute healthcare needs. And in all four countries, uh, this health reception has been voluntary, which is not that common in Europe, in many countries, particularly in the East, but also in Germany. Um, th this kind of uh, infectious disease focus is compulsory for, for refugees. And so in this report, uh, there's also been an analysis of of the content of mental health screening, as you will understand later on here, we think that mental health is an important part of the health reception for refugees. And what we see here is that uh, Denmark seems to be the most ambitious uh, country when it comes to policies in this area. Here in, in Denmark, uh, all children, I mean, children defined as children below 16, um, are routinely offered a mental health screening, while in other countries it's not addressed at all, like in Finland or in Sweden and uh, Norway. It depends on who does this and also to different regional policies. Uh, when, with regards to the organization of the healthcare, there are also differences in the Nordic countries. Um, Norway and Sweden follow the mainstream in Europe and offer um, healthcare within the regular um, healthcare organization, be it national or as in Norway or regional as in Sweden. Uh, while Denmark and Finland stands out, uh, ha having this kind of healthcare in a separate parallel uh, organization closely affiliated with the asylum centers. Uh, the second piece of work that I'm going to present to you briefly is, is a PhD thesis. Um, and myself coming from the preventive child health area, having been working with the Swedish Born and Wurtzentraler uh, for many, many years, uh, thinks this is a really, really um, good and interesting study. Uh, it is based on qualitative work and uh, what, what is found here is that in the asylum centers in Denmark, uh, the preventive child health nurses really are successful in establishing and sustaining trustful relations with the asylum seeking parents, despite the difficult living conditions that they live under. And so 
um, it's obvious here that this is um, maybe a somewhat neglected actor in the integration of refugees as parents. Uh, but what this thesis also um, shows very clearly is that the structural conditions, uh, the families having very little money, living a lot of different families in the same apartment, and the legal concerns that they're under make uh, real prevention difficult. Uh, and I would just like also to point out that, that this experience is particularly actually relevant for the other Nordic countries um, that do have a nurse-based preventive health approach for, for the preschool children and babies. Um, so for those of you who are interested in, the, in this, like me, I can really recommend um, this work. And then finally, I'm going to spend most of my time um, on this uh, cross-country uh, comparative study, which takes its aim from what Signe said uh, a little while ago, that there are many similarities in the, in the Nordic countries when it comes to welfare policies, uh, but there are also important differences. And one area of national policy where there are obvious differences, or at least were obvious differences at when we, um, with the data we've been working, um, is with migration and integration policy, uh, where Den Denmark um, ha has been standing out as having a much less um, satisfactory um, policy with, in the perspective uh, of this EU compares this EU indicators. So, um, what this study um, is based on children, on refugees that uh, were uh, given residency as children. Um, and were given this residency before uh, or until 2005. And they were followed up uh, in young adulthood between 2006 and 2015. And if we see this graph, you can see also um, implicitly the numbers that are quite different. Just, we see that Sweden uh, in the, our cohort have over 100,000 young refugees, while Finland has much less, they have less than 10,000. Um, but you also see that this is an historic study. We're talking about refugee reception uh, quite a long time ago. And uh, this is, of course, the main limitation also. But we think that there are things that we learned here that we can also use to look at the situation today. We used the national registers that we have in all four countries to create Indic these indicators of health. And uh, the design is that we, we have compared the refugees with the uh, people who were born in, in our countries of the same gender. And we are primarily using relative measures, which means that if there is a relative risk or an odds ratio here of two, means that the risk is twice as high as in the native-born population. And um, the first indicator that we have is also um, the classic and the sharpest, but also, fortunately, a quite rare uh, outcome in this age group, its mortality. And what we see here is that the Danish refugees stand out. They have a, about 40% higher mortality rate than the native population in Denmark. And when we go further into those numbers, we can see that what we that this is uh, explained by male refugees having uh, about 75 to 80 percent higher mortality rate than the native-borns, and that the mortality we are talking about is what we, um, in morbidity terms, call external cause and primarily accidental deaths. So um, we haven't been allowed yet to go into the details of, of these deaths, but, but we have reason to, to suspect that we are talking about the traffic and traffic deaths. 
Um, disability pension is an indicator of chronic health problems. And uh, we uh, have the, our indicator is defined as disability pension at age 30. And what we see here, again, is that male refugees in Denmark stand out. Uh, they have about twice uh, the rate of male native-borns um, for this indicator. The next indicator is having been in inpatient psychiatric care. And this is then, of course, an indicator of severe of a general indicator of severe psychiatric morbidity. And what we see here is that in all um, three countries uh, included in, in this um, indicator, um, there is a clear male-female discrepancy in all three countries. So males do worse. Then if we're looking at the most severe of them all, which is the psychotic disorder. And for psychotic disorders, many hospital admissions are compulsory, which means that uh, police pick these people up on the street or in people's homes or wherever they are, because they can no longer take care of themselves. Um, and so this is a rare indicator, but it's also a very valid indicator of sphere of psychiatric problems. And here we see that for men and women, uh, the risk is higher, considerably higher than in the general population. And again, that male refugees in Denmark stand out. Um, outpatient psychiatric care is a slightly softer indicator, if you want, for psychiatric morbidity. Um, that's, that's, uh, here we also have milder forms of psychiatric problems. Um, and here, again, we see that male refugees in Denmark stand out with a 45% higher rate than the native-borns. Um, but we also see something else, which this graph wants to show. We see that for men in Norway and, Den in, and Sweden, there's a, a little bit of a discrepancy between the higher risk for inpatient care and the lower risk for outpatient care. And this we interpret as barriers for accessing outpatient care. But because what, what you want with a fun well functioning psychiatric care organization is that patients with severe psychiatric problems get into touch with psychiatric care before their problems become so severe that they have to be put in the hospital. And uh, what we see here and what we have shown in other studies in the CAGE project is that this is less often the case for uh, refugee patients and particularly male refugee patients. And substance abuse um, is a problem for uh, refugees in Denmark, particularly the male refugees, also the male refugees in Sweden, but not on the same level. So, and then we have the final indicator, which is something um, is having used during one year, 2015, um, a prescribed psychotropic drug. And here we see that uh, the male refugees in Denmark stand out in, re in relation to female refugees in Denmark, but also that uh, in, also in Finland, <clears throat> refugees use more uh, psychotropic drug drugs compared with the native populations. Uh, so, in summary, there is a high burden of severe mental health problems in male refugees in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. And um, Interestingly enough, uh, the gender differential was particularly pronounced in Denmark, which also uh, means that male refugees in Denmark have consistently worse health indicators compared with male refugees in Norway and Sweden. And this is, of course, primarily when we talk about psychiatric morbidity, but also when we talk about mortality and disability pension and that there are barriers for accessing outpatient psychiatric 
care in, for refugees in Norway and Sweden, but less pronounced um, in Denmark. Unfortunately, we cannot say much about Finland with this indicator, and this is primarily because the population of refugees in Finland is not so large and that we did not have access to hospital data. The implications of this study is that a restrictive immigration policy that in Denmark was associated with negative health consequences for male refugees at least. And when we look at the outcomes for education and labor market, we have a similar cross-country pattern. One way of looking at, at, at this is that maybe if the national level of immigration policy uh, sends signals that this is not an important area, that the most important thing about immigration policy is keeping um, immigrants out, that that also trickles down and influences the way education is handled, the way labor market policy is handled. Now I'm speculating, but this would be a very interesting area to go into further after having seen our findings. We also see that the health reception for refugees needs to in include elements that lower barriers to accessing psychiatric care in the short, but also in the longer uh, time perspective. And we see here that here Denmark seems to be um, the country to follow and that the other Nordic countries could look at Denmark um, to, to get ideas about how this could be improved. Finally, something that is close to my heart is that uh, preventive child health nurses um, might be a neglected uh, group of people, um, but that they ha could contribute uh, to make a nice contribution to the integration of refugees as parents into the new society. And so, thank you. Thank you. To be discussed further on in a short moment when we start the discussion panel. Thank you. Um, there were some technical problems. I believe that your presentation did, did not come through as a whole, but I remember, uh, I remind the audience uh, that all the presentations will be available on the website as the address uh, shows here right now. So um, we will now have a guest representing the social, the civil society, Anne Julin Grune. Anjolin Grune from, from Finland. Uh, are you with us? Hi. Yes. Yes. And you are here because you um, you are uh, representing a, a cultural center uh, called Luckan. Uh, freely translated as the gap. Um, could you please tell us more about your uh, the center and what it aims to do? Yes. So we are a Finland Swedish information and counseling center. We offer activities for families, for young people uh, in Swedish. But look at integration that I'm the head of development of is a low threshold information and counseling point for immigrants that is open to all, regardless of status. And we support people in finding a job, studies, language courses, and so on. And we also offer also different kinds of workshops to support uh, job searching, uh, as well as uh, then we organize also social gatherings and mentorship programs and networking uh, concepts in order to enhance uh, networks between local and foreign born people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we have also this um, uh, autumn started actually a STIG in TVO project that I just want to say shortly about, which is with the uh, Åbo Academy University and uh, the university, the, sorry, now I need to look at my notes here, with the Swedish School of Social Sciences and Folk Health. And, and the aim of this project is exactly to, to enhance the rights of refugee children within the services offered 
by the public, private and third sector. So tune into that one. Mm -hmm. So that's shortly about Lucan mm -hmm. integration. Yeah. yeah. And how, how did how the did CAGE the report, report so far so re reflect the needs that you, you uh, mentioned just now? Uh, yes. Um, well, I think uh, it really shows how one problem leads to the next. And also, I think it's really important to look at uh, that when we want to work for children and young people's well-being, we need to, of course, look at the services available for them. But it, it's, a, it's so incredibly important to look at the family as a whole. And, and when we look at the unemployment rates for the immigrant-born uh, population in Finland, uh, we can see that it's it's two and a half times higher than from the native born majority population and also many are employed in jobs that do not match their skills so um, this is relevant because if we think that the socioeconomic uh, like uh, level of the family is a very, a very important factor also in uh, in order to uh, to support children uh, in, in, in within education, and we know that poverty affects negatively on educational outcomes and the performance of children in the, after that, then we also have to recognize that it's very important to, uh, to support the parents' uh, employment. And also the lack of, an, like, of employment or like not being involved in the working life in Finland uh, then also gives less support that parents are not able to support the children as much in finding their first job or to know how to behave at the workplace, which is normal when uh, children find work or like when you're trying to, many parents help their children to find their first work and summer jobs and so on. And also, of course, the problem of this unemployment that we see in our clients is that then there is also a lack of positive role models that children grow up with uh, parents who are in, unable to access the system and are not appreciated for who they are in it. And that's uh, not very positive for a child to, to grow up with that kind of uh, like um, vision of their future. Mm -hmm. And you, so you, you, can you can actually strengthen that part of, of uh, their, their self-esteem within your, your activities. Exactly that. I, I think we also see in our services asylum seekers who are struggling to find employment uh, because they can start working after three months or six months, depending on if they have a passport or not. And there we see that they have a risk of ending up in jobs where maybe labor rights are not always adhered to and being like in precarious jobs. Um, then also for asylum seekers, there's also lack of study, uh, like study possibilities and, uh, and, and what to do during their, the time while they're waiting for the decision. And this causes frustrations and has a very quick impact on a person's well-being. So young people who come here, they need, of course, to, to continue and move on in their lives. But parents also need, uh, need language studies and meaningful activities in order to be sound parents. And, um, and also we can see that the services for asylum seekers vary from region to region. That in Helsinki has been possible to attend courses at adult education institutions while you're an asylum seeker. But for instance, in Kirkonomi, it is not. Mm. And... Um, so that's uh, they also a little bit different positions depending on where they and where they are waiting for their decision. Mm -hmm. And the major problem I think for families that are asylum seekers has been that they are shifted around from place to place and not able to kind of uh, you know stay in one place and build up a, like a, a like a, a everyday life in one one place. Mm -hmm. And so I think this Danish example is really important because it shows that the strengthening of the agency of a parent. Uh, is very positive, but when the structures inhibit those possibilities for parents to be parents, uh, then uh, it has uh, you can't really. Uh, it's difficult to strengthen the children's well-being enough, and I see that in Finland. Uh, I would su suggest, I make a suggestion now that I feel that why not uh, extend the right for children to have uh, the right to attend daycare, early uh, childhood education, mm. while they are waiting for the decision. This was would uh, have many positive impacts, what I would think, mm. in creating a ability and routines and so on. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew Julien, for your 
for your suggestions. Uh, we are actually m we have to uh, have we have to have the time for a quick break before we uh, go on with the panel discussion. So I have to thank you so much for your inspiring uh, talk about uh, your your center. Thank you. Uh, we are no, now going on, we are going to uh, introduce you to a film during our five minute pause. That means that the uh, discussion panel will be starting within five minutes and that is a quarter to three. So please uh, join us watching a film during the pause and then uh, we will welcome you to the discussion panel. Thank you so much for so long. Yeah, I heard. Att det kan ta fem till tio år för en flykting att hitta ett jobb. Varför? Jag vill jobba, utbilda mig och få samma chanser som alla andra. Hur ser det ut i de andra nordiska länderna? Vad fungerar bra? Vilka utmaningar står vi inför? Du som arbetar med integration kan hjälpa mig. Dela dina erfarenheter på integrationnorden.org. So welcome back everybody and uh, we are very happy to uh, welcome also Professor Ravi Cooley from the UK to this conference. Uh, so, Ravi, you will kickstart the panel with your own reflections upon CAGE. Please, we would love to listen to it. And do we have the sound? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Now, so now, so we, see now we see the picture. picture. Please, Please uh, update, update us on, on what do we see on the first, picture? On the first picture. Now, I wanted to start uh, my reflections on the CAGE project's work by introducing uh, the experiences of refugees is captured by Calliope Lemos here in this uh, sculpture, which is in the middle of uh, the financial district in London now. It captures both the beauty and the danger of being a refugee. It captures something about the hopes and expectations people travel with, and when they arrive, the things that they find. The reason CAGE is important to me from an international perspective and why the cross-cutting perspectives are probably cross-joining perspectives from an international point of view. And if we can go to the second slide now. Is that... Uh, it, can you... The can you can, yeah, okay, so we have, it, we have, the, we second have the, slide the second slide right, slide right now. now. The second slide, brilliant. Okay, and you have all of the words on the second slide mm -hmm. visible? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Super. Okay, so my reflections are as follows, and I'm going to take about four minutes to do this. CAGE, I think, provides a window to the cultures, laws, policies and practices across the Nordic region in a way which I think no other study has yet been able to do from my point of view. And, you know, one of the things that I often say within the Nordic context is that young refugees are answers they're not questions or threats, they are answers to the situations that we face in our mature democracies now. And I wish that we could develop a narrative around them, which would be about seeing them as people who come, not as question marks, not as threats, but as resolutions to us. So what are they an answer to? I think they provide an additional element in our countries of safety, health, happiness, diversity, prosperity, and how to be productive citizen. The problem, I think, is that Cage amply demonstrates that their hopes and expectations and their plans cannot be met within the frameworks and the practices that are around in the Nordic countries at present. And Carl's earlier presentation, I think, sort of really picked up on this and reminded me so strongly that there was a question once around integration, which is the question about maybe letting people in and maybe helping them to settle down. And now it's become the dominant no question in relation to the rediscovery of ordinary life. And ordinary life in terms of education, health and the labor market is very extraordinarily difficult to establish. 
The second thing I think that Cage does is shows us that the policies that are written in black and white in straight, simple sentences are not the same as lives which are lived in colour. That there is something about the untidiness of life and the tidiness of policies which doesn't quite yet fit together. And we need to find further ways in which policies in life can come to each other's rescue and not get in each other's way. The, the other element that Cage shows us is that young refugees are always in a position of being navigators and they navigate in at least two dimensions, the vertical opportunities in relation to education, in relation to health and in relation to labor markets and the horizontal connections in their lives in relation to culture, friendships, family and so on that they are traveling in different dimensions at the same time, and that we need to think about practices and policies which support that. And Andy's uh, indication of the way in which nurses could work to help them manage the verticality and the horizontal nature of their travel could be thought about more. I love the fact that Cage helps us to see the connections between patterns and incidents more clearly, and that it's a mixed methodological frame where quantitative uh, analysis and qualitative detail live hand in hand. And I think we need more of that. And my final point <clears throat> is Cage may not have all the answers, but it helps us to ask better questions. And I think one of the questions that's left over for me is how do we define and measure mutual benefits of having young refugees amongst us over time? And how do we learn within the Nordic region and internationally about how things go? Because without asking questions about understanding the wellness of things, I think we can come back often to rediscovering how things are going badly. And I think the badness and the wellness live together and both have a right to be understood better. Thank you. Paula. Thank you so much. Um, introduction again about what we see, uh, all the smiling faces. What exactly is the situation here and when was it taken? Yeah, the smiling faces uh, are people receiving Hungarian uh, refugees arriving into the Danish border in 1956. And they are offering uh, Danish pastry, uh, the warm coffee and happy smiles. And the picture to the right is how uh, the uh, space for refugees is uh, considered by some in Denmark in, um, uh, in uh, 2015, when a, a larger number of refugees arrived to our country. So that's the idea. And it's a perfect illustration, isn't it, uh, of the contrast of the situations, uh, as, as uh, Coley uh, mentioned, um, maybe letting people in is the attitude these days. Um, I would like to start uh, uh, asking uh, Karolis Shibas, uh, from what you have seen and heard so far today uh, by all the presentations, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for reminding me in, in this very interesting uh, community of researchers. Uh, so, first of all, uh, yeah, I'm not representing the research institution, I'm representing UNHCR, representation in Nordic and Baltic countries. But uh, being a researcher myself, having the academic background in the sociology of migration, I would say that big thank you and the congratulations to the CAGE project with a very timely, relevant, and I would say methodologically very well equipped. Um, research uh, to contribute to the ongoing debates. And I think that uh, this, uh, you know, interlinkage between the cage and health and labor market, I think this is something that we really needed, especially in terms of integration of, of, of young refugees. Uh, what I would really like to emphasize here, yeah, and, and, and actually my reading of the report is, is, is that we really um, experience or looking actually at, at, at the so-called social reproduction, when we see that there are different uh, gaps between the, you know, uh, local foreign born population on the one hand and, and, and local population and foreign born especially re refugees uh, in terms of healthcare, education and, and, and labor market. And, and actually that social reproduction, you know, it's, 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 it's not becoming, I would say, smaller in, in, in terms of, of, 
of, of, of, of the scope. So I think that uh, this gap shows that uh, that uh, I would say, uh, in regardless of the fact that we have a legal framework for the equal opportunities, we have to ensure the equal access to equal opportunities. And I think that this is really, really very much related to also the arguments that that our um, uh, speakers uh, already provided. So, so this is the first thing. Uh, uh, another thing is, I would say that we should actually look at this uh, in the entire context of the policy measures that have been recently implemented in all the countries, and also in, in, in the context of COVID-19, because we really see that uh, there is an a unproportional effect or impact on the refugee community yeah, as far as the COVID-19 is concerned, and also during the, our uh, latest mapping, it seems that the uh, young refugees, they are also affected quite heavily by the COVID-19. And actually, by adding on the top of that uh, temporary asylum uh, instruments, or as we say, restrictions, we also see that uh, you know, it doesn't help actually to, to, to foster integration. Uh, especially, uh, I would also like to emphasize unaccompanied minors and, and, and young refugees. And I think that these temporary asylum instruments, they have tremendous impact on the long-term integration outcomes. Uh, and not just in terms of accessing the labor market or actually improving the educational indicators, but also having the self-resilience, self-reliance, and also uh, having the sense of belonging to, you know, the integration programs and the country and the society in general. So I think these are, these are, uh, these are for the very beginning, I would say these are the, the very important elements. And, and for sure, what we are actually emphasizing in the United Nations High Commission of Refugees is that, you know, very well, uh, I would say slogan is, uh, you know, nothing about us without us. And uh, what we've been looking at is that uh, there is a trend that the refugees, they are um, included in the implementation of theorist integration programs. But what is still lacking and also it's lacking in the Nordic countries is that the refugees, especially young refugees, they would be included as the co-designers and co-creators of integration policies. Because we heard all, already from Ravi that you know, refugees, they are not the questions, they are answers. And by trying to actually create a holistic approach to integration, I think that there should be a bit uh, more structural and more institutionalized approach by engaging refugees, actually, not only in the implementation of the programs, but also in the co-design that will actually help to create a sense of belonging, because integration is, first of all, never-ending process. Uh, integration is not a project, and actually, uh, we should look at it, it um, a bit more beyond, uh, you know, just uh, let's say labor market education and healthcare sector. Thank you so Thank much. You so um, much. Um, I would I love to hear to uh, if there is anyone uh, from the panel who would like to comment on uh, the suggestions and the, the aspects that you were mentioning. Um, Anders, uh, Signe, or um, Ravi, would you like to comment on, on what uh, Carolis just said? I will be happy to um, to comment on it. I very much agree that and often we do research on looking into barriers of facilitators from the perspectives of young refugees or other immigrant groups, but having them on board, being co-creators of the science, of the evidence, is crucial. And I think that's very important, a very important message to to take with us, not only the, the, the CAGE project, but future research and, and also for policymakers and and practitioners. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, Anders, Anders, is there is an, an aspect you would, you would you'd like to present? Um, no, I can, uh, of course, I, I completely agree with this. I think the main problem today is that um, we're in such a defensive situation when we talk about migrants and migrant policy that it's, uh, what would have been would have seemed possible in my country five years ago, now seems a very long way, a, uh, a long way uh, to go. But I think that we in research can certainly be in the front line of that by by using uh, uh, the refugees themselves as uh, co work co collaborators in our studies. And I mean, we we have had. Some, and I think uh, by adding the qualitative, by having the qualitative studies, 
and and also by having our user boards, we have to some extent at least tried to meet these. But there is, I think, there is so much more we could do. Mm. Um, um, and and the, some of the some keywords of the key that, we that we have been, been uh, listening, listening to, to today, today is is, is um, integration, integration. The key to integration, integration uh, is to feel safe, safe, to feel belonging, and to achieve in school. school. My wonder my is, wonder why is, can't why we, can't uh, we uh, as rich as and wealthy, rich uh, and wealthy uh, countries of the Nordics, Nordics, why can't why we, can't we uh, achieve uh, the, results the results to help them to go help them come to that, come to that uh, feeling of feeling safeness, of belonging, and achievement? achievement. What, is, what is why is it why so, is it so hard? hard? I think that um, uh, the question is easier to ask is to give uh, Paula in, the, in these circumstances there are probably lots of uh, tributaries to why people act on the basis of fear rather than welcome uh, roots are deep and they're pretty extended uh, that, uh, that, you know, that um, if policy is based on, on a sense of um, uh, death of two things then it won't advantage you young refugees. Those two things are that our, our past will die and our future will die if we let them in. So fear, fear, is, fear is one of the main the reasons, reasons why, why, why the restrictions, the restrictions are, are, closing are closing in, would you say? Yeah, uh, I think, I think um, um, people can uh, want for all sorts of, actually in some ways of very understandable reasons, they want life to uh, change, but in a tolerable way. They want continuity, they want coherence, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think the narrative around refugees is that refugees represent a lack of continuity and the lack of coherence in public life and in private life. And I think that that's the narrative that needs to be changed in relation to young refugees bringing life to a country rather than bringing other things, that they act as a way of cross-pollinating a, a country so that it becomes that it becomes to feel more alive over time. And that is actually a narrative that we have responsibility for as researchers, not just uh, um, at the UNHCR, which does a brilliant job of putting that narrative forward. Mm -hmm. now, refugees bring life is something that we need to see made visible in public policy. Mm. Um, um, you, you, uh, can I? Yes, Signe. Yes, Signe. Uh, yeah, I just want to piggyback on, on Ravi's comments. Some of the issues is also the segregation policies. I think one of the uh, key answers to this is that their inclusion, the meeting, the encounter between the majority population and their young refugees or refugees in general will break down some of this fear. So some of the policies that have been introduced in the Nordic countries have to be keeping people separate in the schools, in the work life, in the healthcare institution, et cetera. And I think if we break down these, these barriers for meeting, and it's also a thing that the case study have shown that the young refugees themselves ask for more contact to their peers, their native born peers, in order to learn how to navigate in a new society, learn the new codes, the social codes, practice the language training, etc. So, yeah, so I was just saying, according to the fear aspect, that one thing was to include and not be you or us and them, but it's a we. Thank you so Thank much, Zina. And time is really running fast, and uh, we actually have to wrap this up. And uh, before we uh, say goodbye um, and continue with the breakout room uh, workshop groups, if I would ask you, each one of you, to, um, to put a message forward to the politicians in each of your countries, what would that message be? Paul, in your question, my message is this help young refugees to experience safety, belonging and success in your countries because it's beneficial for you that that happens. Thank you. Um, Carolis. Yes, from, from our side, basically, the most important issue, as, as I said, it's for sure nothing 
uh, uh, about us without us, which means that we have to really, really engage practically refugees into decision-making process, especially young ones. The other one is for sure we have to ensure secure and long-term status for the young refugees to be able to fill their, their livelihoods. And the third one is actually for sure to test and the pilot such issues as community sponsorship for refugees, which is now actually in the face of the development of the disability study in, in Sweden. Okay. okay. Anders, would you like Anders, to contribute? Well, I, um, I would say that, um, um, that we heard a lot of nice words from, from our state secretary about um, national policy with regards to education for refugees in Sweden. Mm. Uh, what we see, however, is that um, very little of those nice words have been put into practice. And I think that um, providing equal possibilities for succeeding in education is probably the single most important thing um, we can do uh, in the long run to, to help refugees um, meet um, how to say this, uh, to uh, reach, to be able to reach their own potential and create their own lives on their own um, in, in an equal manner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, all of you for this very short, uh, unfortunately short uh, panel. Uh, we will have to move on right now with the breakout sessions. Um, all the audience, uh, our participants, you have received an email from us with a link to, uh, that leads you directly into the breakout rooms that you have chosen for today. So please check your email. Uh, if you would have a problem finding it there, there is another way of finding your room through our website. Uh, and the address should be uh, on a crawler uh, showing right now. Um, with this said, I, I would like to thank you all for uh, being part of this uh, really interesting day. Our guests, all the researchers, the experts and all of you, the viewers out uh, there, all of the world. And uh, enjoy your afternoon in the workshops. Thank you so much.